Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. This is Robin Osborne from Michigan State University. My EAB University colleagues are Professors Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from Ohio State University Extension. And we're happy to share with you today's webinar entitled Dicamba and Trees, Old Herbicides Causing New Problems. Presented by Robbie Deerhoff, forest entomologist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Robbie has worked in the Missouri Department of Conservation's forest health program since 2013, first as the forest health specialist and now as the forest entomologist. She received both her BS and MS in biology from Truman State University, studying Belizean katydids for her master's thesis. Robbie is a lifelong bug nerd and has an insect collection she started over 30 years ago. I'm wondering how many bugs are in that collection. Both Robbie and her husband work in conservation and enjoy teaching their two young sons about hunting, fishing, and most importantly, trees. We welcome your comments and questions today, so please feel free to type them in the chat pod or the Q&A pod. Robbie will be answering them right after this presentation. Tomorrow you will receive an email that will have a short voluntary confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. It helps us bring these free educational webinars to you. The email will also include our presenter's contact information, as well as information on how to obtain CEUs for this live webinar. And I wanted to just uh, stress the fact that we can only give CEUs for two participants of the live webinar at this time. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www emeraldashbor.info website. Thank you for attending today, everyone. And Robbie, could you please unmute your, unmute your mic and you can begin your presentation. Unfortunately, I accidentally hit your mic. All right, we're seeing your, your, your screen is the other can screen. Can you hear you me get. now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Good. Okay. We All just right. need well, to get sorry. to your other. There we go. Thank you, Robbie. I'm we'll sorry I messed up there. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. Okay. Well, thank you, Robin, for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who is listening in today. Um, I hope that this is a, a topic that you've heard about before, at least to some extent, or that you've maybe followed in the news. Um, but if you're new to this topic, I'll be covering enough of the history and sort of what we've been seeing the last few years that you should be able to get up to speed on this pretty quickly. So like Robin said, I am the forest entomologist uh, for the Conservation Department in Missouri. And some of you may have thought, um, what, entomologists? What are you doing talking about herbicides? Well, good point. Um, you know, about four years ago, I did not know much about herbicides. I wasn't real concerned about herbicides. That was sort of a, a different group of people in our state that didn't really overlap onto trees for me anyway, as the forest health specialist and then the forest entomologist. Uh, so herbicides are certainly used in forest situations and are key tools for that, just like they are in ag crops. Um, however, it just there wasn't a lot of uh, injury going on on trees across Missouri and our forests, and so I just wasn't real concerned with it. But as you can see, uh, this, this white oak here in my intro photo, it looks like it's melting. And um, this is just not normal for trees in Missouri or really anywhere. They shouldn't look like they're melting. So once we started seeing this and seeing it on a widespread scale, that's when I decided this entomologist needed to learn more about herbicides. So this actually, this tree is actually on a conservation area in Missouri. This is where trees may get hit with herbicide because our land managers want to kill them for edge feathering or whatever the case may be, but they should not be getting hit from herbicides coming off the soybean field across the road. So if you follow the news, 
you've probably heard a lot of things, uh, a lot of grumblings about dicamba over the last few years. Um, there was even one farmer that was allegedly killed by a neighbor's farm hand over the use of dicamba. There's been tons of lawsuits. There's been thousands, literally thousands of drift complaints in the last few years in lots of states, um, Missouri included, but 19, 20 or more different states have seen a huge increase in the number of uh, pesticide misuse complaints that have been filed. Even the iconic cypress trees on Real Foot Lake uh, have shown some, some dicamba injury in recent years, which that's pretty concerning. So in general, it's just really been a black eye for agriculture, as this Arkansas farmer stated. It's brought out the absolute worst in people. I hate it for agriculture because it's a real black eye for us. This has really torn at the fabric of these, these farming communities because while it is an issue for natural resources, it's also been a huge issue for ag. A lot of farmers have had crops that have been injured by, by these new dicamba products. So this all started in Missouri uh, in 2016, really in 2015, uh, but 2016, it was a really bad year for Bader Farms. This year is Bill Bader. He has a very large peach orchard, several thousand trees in Southern Missouri down in our boot heel. And if you've ever been through the boot heel of Missouri, you'll know that it was once a swamp and it's very, very flat and there's a lot of row crop ag down there. Um, there are some specialty farms too, as well. Uh, here we have peaches, but there's also cantaloupe, a lot of melons, other melons, a lot of uh, tomatoes, things like that. So huge row crop ag, cotton, rice, um, corn, beans, and Bader farms. And Bill Bader, he started noticing in 2015 that the leaves on his peach trees were curling a little bit. Didn't really know what was going on, but suspected some sort of herbicide injury. Then in 2016, he really got hit hard. His trees just didn't look right. Um, the, the fruits were aborting, not forming correctly, and he suffered a huge loss. So at that point, the Missouri Department of Ag, which is the pesticide regulating agency in our state, um, started looking into this and they found that volatilization off of uh, neighboring fields of dicamba had likely contributed to this. And, they did go ahead and find some people in the area for misuse of the pesticide, but poor Mr. Bader did not receive any restitution from this. So he ended up filing a suit against the chemical companies um, that are making these new dicamba products and these new uh, dicamba tolerant seeds. But at that time, there were no labeled over the top uh, dicamba products on the market. This was, remember this 2016, prior to those being introduced. And so all the dicamba that was sprayed and injured his trees was coming from products that were being misapplied, basically. They weren't be applied, being applied according to the label. However, I remember hearing about this. I just didn't think that it was that big of a deal at the time. I wasn't too concerned about it because it was, to be honest with you, peach trees and not forest trees. So the next year, my work partner and I, the forest pathologist, we were sitting there at our desks and we share a wall, a short partition, and this this came through. You can see this, uh, consider your neighbor the spray season. It's an article published uh, by the University of Missouri. And it was talking about these new products, these new dicamba products that were going to be sprayed during the warmer part of the growing season. And I didn't realize just how much of a big deal this was until I saw that picture of those tomato plants. And I do love trees, but I can't tell you how much I love tomato plants and growing tomatoes. So when I saw those curled tomato plants, I thought, wow, really need to pay attention to this. So I started looking more into it and we alerted our, our foresters in the state of Missouri that they may be seeing some of this injury and to, to keep us posted on, on trees. And so for us, that was sort of the beginning. It was a, hmm, uh-oh, what, what's about to happen here? And boy, did it happen. So I started looking into the history of this. Um, where, what's up with dicamba? It's not really a, a product that I was terribly familiar with. So what's been going on is several ag companies have been developing seed traits for a number of years. You know, it takes many, many years um, to, to get these traits right. 
They've been developing dicamba tolerance in cotton and soybeans, which that's significant because these two crops are highly sensitive to dicamba and 2,4-D, these growth regulating herbicides. So this extend trait is dicamba tolerance and glyphosate, glyphosate being Roundup, which many of you are familiar with. Um, cotton was developed, the seed trait, extend trait was released in 2015, and then soybeans were released in 2016. Now, there are some, some corn seeds that have this trait in them, and there's some corn that's probably going to be released within the next five years or so that has, I think, five different herbicide tolerance traits in it. Um, so corn is sort of a different beast at this point. We're mostly focused on cotton and soybeans right now. So it's interesting that cotton was, was released in 2015, soy in 2016. It's interesting because it wasn't until 2017 that this low volatility dicamba for over the top, meaning growing season once the plants have, have come out of the ground, over the top application was not approved until 2017. So a lot of farmers in the Missouri boot heel down in Arkansas were just desperate for a new form of weed control because so many weeds had become resistant to a lot of the herbicides, including glyphosate, that were currently in use. And so they knew they had the seed technology in this cotton and some of these soybeans. And so they were really tempted to spray old versions of dicamba that were highly volatile during the growing season. And that's how Bill Bader's peach farm was injured. 2017, that's when the low volatility dicamba came out. Here's the different products, Ingenia, Extendamax, Bexapan, and then in 2019, Syngenta came out with Tabium. So you think, well, it's probably good. We have these low volatility products now. Great. Okay. Well, on the 2,4-D side, there's the Enlist trait, which that is in soybeans, um, cotton, and corn. And that is the 2,4-D tolerance plus glyphosate and glufosinate in some varieties. So the soybeans were released in 2015 in those states listed there. The cotton was released in 2016 and the corn in 2018. And now we've had uh, E3 soybeans, which are re were released last growing season. So these were quickly adopted for widespread use, meaning that there's going to be quite a bit of 2,4-D out on the landscape in addition to the, the dicamba being that these two herbicides are, are both growth regulators and fairly closely related in the grand scheme of things. Um, we're going to start to see a lot more injury that on the landscape that is caused by these two um, herbicides and that injury is going to end up looking pretty similar for our trees. So low, low volatility 2,4-D for over-the-top application um, was released in 2015 and it's a new 2,4-D choline called Colex D technology. So I'm going to show you some maps of the, the different acreages here of cotton, corn, and soy. So here you can see all the states where, um, counties where we're planting cotton in the U.S. And here we have the soybean acres. While there's only about 13 million acres of cotton that's planted annually in the U.S., there's approximately 90 million acres a year that's planted to soy. Um, and in the last couple of years, it's been right around 80 to 84 million acres of soybeans. And here we have corn. Corn is also around 90 million acres a year, although it's been a little higher recently at about 92 to 94 million. So the point of showing you these maps is that look at all those, those green and yellow counties across the U.S. There are so many places that we may not think of being truly ag counties. Um, I'm in the, the middle of Missouri, sitting in the middle of Columbia, and I don't think much about there being ag nearby, but within two miles or even less than that, there's a bean field. And that bean field has the potential to be planted to an extend trait soybean and potentially have dicamba sprayed on it. So a lot of us really do live very close to where you know these herbicides are being used. So what is it about dicamba that, you know, how does this thing work? Well, it increases the plant's growth rate and it basically causes that plant to outgrow its nutrient supply and die. That's the pretty simplistic version of it. And 2,4-D is gonna work in a, a pretty similar way. So dicamba, the reason why I titled my talk Old Herbicides Causing New Problems is because dicamba was developed in 1942 and it was registered in the United States in 1967. So it's been around for quite a while. 
it's traditionally sprayed in the early part of the growing season and usually in cornfields as a burn down. So they spray it to get rid of those winter annual and early spring annual weeds, take care of those weeds, plant, and then not use it again because in the, the warmer part of the growing season. In cooler weather, below 60 degrees, it's either not volatile or very, very low volatility. But usually that time of year, um, sensitive species, you know, lots of tree species and, and plants are not leafed out, so it's not a big deal um, if there is a little bit of volatility floating around, at least not from a plant perspective. Summer applications have traditionally been avoided, and that's because temperature inversions can lead to drift. Uh, volatilization is very common in the summer with high temperatures and high humidity and when the soil or when the herbicide contacts leaves rather than soil and there's many many known sensitive species out there in fact most of the labels of the older dicamba products say hey don't spray this around um, desirable trees and uh, herbaceous plants broadleaf plants conifers things like that because most of these plants are very sensitive to dicamba and 2,4-D. so there has been a renewed interest in this old herbicide in recent years because we've seen so much uh, glyphosate resistance. So there's been a lot of Roundup Ready crops planted in the US um, for you know, several decades now. And of course, when you use the same herbicide over and over and over again, you're gonna end up with some resistance. And it's gotten to where a lot of leaves just laugh at the farmers when they spray glyphosate on them. So dicamba, it, it kills weeds under four inches tall really well because like I said, it causes them to have this uncontrolled growth and they outgrow their nutrient supply and die. But the, the bigger weeds, they're not as much affected by dicamba. They have to be small weeds, so farmers have to be very specific on when they spray this stuff. And in some places, they're actually seeing resistance to dicamba in three to six generations of these weed populations. So resistance is already forming to dicamba Honestly, that's probably good news for us uh, natural resource folks because maybe that means that there'll be less use of this in future years if it's not killing weeds. So sensitive plants can be injured by as little as one twenty thousandth of a standard use rate. You can see these soybeans right here. This was a study done by Kevin Bradley at the University of Missouri. There's some puckering and cupping in these leaves, and this was one twenty thousandth of the use rate. Now, ultimately, this led to no yield reduction in these beans, but as little as one two hundredth, two hundredth of the use rate in soybeans um, can lead to a 14% yield loss. Why am I talking about beans? Well, I just want to illustrate here that sensitive crops, sensitive trees, things like that can be greatly affected by very, very, very tiny amounts of dicamba. So let's talk about how dicamba can move. Okay, there's, there's a number of ways and most of them are pretty easy to understand. So first and foremost, particle drift or physical drift, I like to refer to it as direct drift because that makes the most sense to me. This is when the sprayer's in the field, maybe it's a super windy day, the applicator's driving 40 miles an hour and the spray just gets over the top of the crop and ends up in the tree line next to it or the field next to it. You get this sort of fan shape um, in the field of injury. So you know that the particle drift, the direct drift from that sprayer is what caused that injury situation. The other way that this can happen is uh, tank contamination. Initially, a lot of applicators didn't realize how little dicamba was needed to actually damage sensitive plants. And so, you know, one farmer might have one or two spray rigs on his farm and he's going to put dicamba in one tank and something else in another tank. And then when he's done spraying dicamba, he's gonna rinse it out and then put another chemical in and go over the top of crops that are potentially sensitive dicamba. And there could still be some residue in that tank. And so initially when all this soybean injury was happening in 2017, a lot of the ag companies wanted to blame the app applicators that they weren't rinsing out their tanks properly in between um, fields and, and different herbicide types. So that's certainly a way that, that plants can be injured through tank contamination. Um, and then of course, temperature inversions. If the applicator is spraying during a temperature inversion, some of those spray droplets could get trapped in that inversion. 
in that air layer. And then as the wind moves that air layer around um, later that day or the next day, then you end up with the herbicide ending up in places it wasn't supposed to. And so temperature inversions are certainly a viable way of, of moving uh, dicamba. And then you've got something called volatility. And this, I think, is the, the one that most people struggle with, and I too struggled with it initially. It's also called vapor drift, and this is the conversion from a liquid to a vapor after on-target application. So picture the farmer going into the field, spraying the field, every spray droplet hits the intended targets, there's no issue, um, you know, they didn't get the tree line or anything like that, the farmer leaves the field. Well, did what he was supposed to do on target application. And next thing you know, this, uh, this herbicide turns into a vapor and it, it drifts off, or as some people like to say, it walks off and it trespasses on somebody else. So vapor drift or volatility is common with dicamba above 85 degrees when it's high humidity and when it contacts leaves. Now, as you can imagine, June in Missouri or much of the Midwest kind of check all these boxes here because we would expect to have soy and cotton tall enough at that time that, um, you know, the, the herbicide would be contacting the leaves and it's definitely going to be hot enough. And my goodness, my curly hair does not like the humidity ever. So I can attest that it's high humidity here. So this, can, this vapor drift, this volatility can continue for 96 hours post application. So it's not just that day's weather conditions that the farmer needs to worry about for application, it's up to four days after application that this could become a problem. And then this, this vapor drift may move, we don't know how far, maybe it could move five miles away, maybe 500 feet, maybe a mile away maybe 10 miles, we don't know. And there could be an atmospheric loading component to it where if a bunch of farmers are spraying during ideal conditions all at the same time, um, then you end up with a lot of this in the, the surrounding air and then you have a really hard time tracing who might have sprayed it, where it was coming from. In fact, it's impossible. Um, and if this does move several miles down the road, how would you ever know which farmer sprayed it? And really, was it the farmer that did it, you know, sprayed it incorrectly, or was it the product that just didn't behave as the farmer anticipated? So 2,4-D is generally considered less volatile than dicamba, but it is a common damage agent in Missouri samples, residue samples, as well as Illinois. And so there is that atmospheric loading component that is um, thought to be possible um, in several states, including Illinois. So just to kind of drive this point home, yes, I know this is a picture of a city and the smokestack coming from that factory there on the left, but this is sort of how I see um, volatilization. You know, it's, it's not just that direct drift. It is this chemical turning into the, the gaseous phase and then who knows where it ends up. You know, it's one of those things, guess what, what you're breathing. Uh, that's kind of concerning to me. There's not been a lot of data presented on the human health hazards of dicamba. Um, in a lot of cases, it's thought that it probably isn't harming humans that much. However, there was a 2020 study published in the Journal of Epidemiology by researchers at the National Institutes of Health that showed that the pesticide um, dicamba can cause an increased risk of developing numerous cancers, including some related to the liver and some cancers, um, lymphoma, uh, just some things that really none of us want to have. And being the mother of two small children living literally a quarter of a mile from a soybean field, this does concern me overall. So just to drive this point home one more time, drift happens while the sprayer is still in the field and volatility occurs after the sprayer has left for up to 96 hours. Okay, so that applicator could have done everything right, hit every box on the 40 page label of extended max and still this product volatilizes after the fact so to me that seems like kind of a problem so let's talk about dicamba use in the u.s so in 2017 we had a huge jump in the number of pounds of dicamba that were used on u.s crop fields so between 2012 and 2016 
there was an average of about two or 770,000 pounds of dicamba that were used. And then in 2017, when we really, you know, started using um, these dicamba products over the top on soy and cotton, we went up to 10 million pounds of dicamba in the U.S. That's, that's a pretty huge jump. Okay? And it's no wonder that we saw so many complaints of misuse across the U.S. So 27 million acres of extend crops were planted that year. Okay, that's cotton and soy. 3.6 million acres of injured soybeans were reported, although that's probably pretty uh, underreported in general. And the, the ag companies that produce these dicamba products uh, reported 99 crop complaints per million acres. So obviously this was different. This was a big shift for ag. Um, and, you know, a lot of farmers had bean fields, cotton fields that were injured. And so because they didn't have the dicamba tolerance in their seed, and so uh, there was some changes that needed to be made before the 2018 growing season. So there were new label restrictions put into place. States were putting restrictions um, in place, such as cutoff dates and uh, you know, buffers and whatnot. And applicators were required to take training. Okay, so theoretically that should, should make it better, right? So in 2018, there were over 50 million acres of extend soy and cotton that were planted. Okay, a lot of those were planted defensively because, uh, you know, farmers did not like what they saw when they got um, their beans were injured the year before. And so they felt like they were forced to buy these extend trait crops in order to, seeds in order to, um, you know, not have this injury show up. So there are 1.1 million acres of injured soybeans that year, which it was again, probably underreported and 13 crop complaints per million acres were submitted to the ag companies that that make these chemicals. So it's important to note that not all the extend beans um, were sprayed with dicamba. So only about 39 million acres of extend crop was, was sprayed with dicamba. Guess what? We had tons and tons of injury complaints that year across many states. So many injury complaints uh, that in my state in Missouri, our, our pesticide uh, bureau was just completely overwhelmed. They went from having, you know, far fewer than 100 complaints a year to over 300 complaints a year. So it was just a lot of, um, it was a lot different for a lot of these, these pesticide regulators. So how can labels be renewed with so many acres injured? So the original labels were for the growing seasons of 2017 and 2018, and they were set to expire at the end of 2018. So what did the EPA decide to do? Well, we wouldn't be having this conversation today if they decided not to relabel those products. So on Halloween of 2018, they renewed the dicamba label for two more years. Talk about a horror show, right? So here we go again with, with two more years of these products and really no significant changes to the actual chemistry of the products. So again, the label became more restrictive. In fact, the Extended Max label, I think, became 41 pages. Yep, that's pages. That's a lot of reading in order to feel like you are fully up to speed on how to, to spray uh, this chemical. And the label became so restrictive that in some states, they calculated just how many hours in the growing season would actually fit within the, the application restrictions. And I think it was for Indiana, it was maybe only 40 hours for the whole growing season that were really within that um, appropriate restriction zone. So that's, that's pretty concerning that these ag companies were really, it seems to me, trying to put a lot of the, the pressure on the applicators um, for any injury that was gonna come across. And again, there was more training, required training for applicators. So in 2019, there were over 60 million acres of extend crops that were planted um, and this is the 39 million acres that were sprayed with dicamba and EPA approved the 24C labels for state cutoff dates. So 24C is a method that a lot of states use to provide, um, you know, kind of more leniency, I guess you could say, um, for their state's applicators on certain federal pesticide labels. So the EPA approves the initial label and then the states get to to add some caveats to that through 24C. States had been using 24C as a quicker and easier way to enact cutoff dates for dicamba. 
Um, and that was working pretty well for the states, but EPA wasn't real impressed with it because that wasn't the intention of those 24C labels. There were over 1,400 injury cases across 19 states in 2019, and we're starting to see weed resistance at that point um, to dicamba. So I guess that's a little bit of, of good news there. So in 2020, the year that we all love so much, 60 plus million acres of extend crops have been planted and most of those have been harvested at this point. In February, our peach farmer Bill Bader received a $265 million settlement from um, a court here in St. Louis. Uh, this is coming against the, the ASF and Bayer. Um, because they were able to show that those companies were kind of practicing some shady stuff and they they knew that that this injury was bound to take place um, just based on the products that they were uh, developing and anyway the courts were able to say yeah we, we believe that um, it looks like you guys were were not practicing the best business practices out there so we had this huge settlement it was really important for um, the ag industry, but but also for natural resources because we were finally able to basically prove, yeah, yeah this is a, a big deal. The Ninth Circuit Court back on June 3rd vacated the labels uh, for these three, for three of the four dicamba over the top products, which was also huge. Um, and it took the EPA five days to respond to that vacator or vacated label situation. Uh, because they, the EPA wasn't quite sure how to, how to handle that. And five days after um, the court did this, the EPA told farmers that you could spray existing stocks of dicamba until July 31st. Um, and then, you know, there would be no more purchasing or selling of these products at that time. But that kind of threw people in a tailspin because they didn't know if dicamba would be available for next year or not. So 80% of Missouri farmers uh, didn't file complaints this year in a recent survey that was conducted just because they didn't feel like, you know, that if they filed a, a herbicide misuse or injury complaint with the Missouri Department of Ag, they didn't feel like it was going to go anywhere. So this is apparently becoming pretty common in most states where herbicide injury is common because, you know, they call it dicamba fatigue. If nothing happens, if your neighbor doesn't get fined or whatever the case is, then you're probably just not going to file a complaint anymore. Interestingly, it was the worst injury year yet for Iowa um, on dicamba because it was hot and dry during the, the spray window for the, this product. So uh, they ended up with lots and lots of injury complaints. And <laughs> Interestingly, the, the chemical companies began pursuing labels for 2021, even after these two huge court decisions um, that were pretty scathing of, of the original labels. So what are we to expect in 2021? Well, unfortunately, those labels were approved by EPA uh, for the over-the-top um, dicamba products. So we'll be seeing more of them in uh, this next growing season and the four growing seasons to follow that because instead of a two-year conditional label like they've done in the past they went with a five-year label so the the thought was to give farmers more um, security that they could you know plan on having this technology in their fields although there's been quite a mixed reaction from the ag community on this uh, five-year approval. There's a lot of people, a lot of farmers that are just not real impressed with this technology and don't wanna use it and don't wanna be forced to use it. Um, and then there's the other side that they really like it and they wanna keep using it. So it's, it's really torn at the ag community quite a bit. So the nationwide cutoff dates have been set at June 30 for soybeans and July 30 for cotton. That's new to the label for 2021. And EPA, EPA has decided that states are gonna to have to use a different process, the 24A process, if they want to enact uh, different cutoff dates in their states. This is gonna be a huge burden on states because it's, they really have to go through a, a more onerous rulemaking process in their own state in order to get this passed. So before the use of 24C labels was a, little, a lot easier for the states to enact these cutoff dates and now the EPA is just making it that much harder. So it'll be interesting to see how states respond to this. There's lots more lawsuits expected on both sides of it. There's some farmers that are suing right now uh, to have more 
uh, or I guess less restrictive cutoff dates for soy and cotton. They want a wider window that they can spray um, dicamba. So that's one set of lawsuits. And then there's also thousands of farmers that are still suing for damages over dicamba injury in the past. So I, I couldn't agree more with this sentiment here or the statement here from Nathan Donnelly. Given EPA approved versions of dicamba have already damaged millions of US acres of crops and natural areas, there's no reason to trust that the agency got it right with this next registration, um, these next five years, because really nothing has, nothing significant has changed with the new labels that are coming out for 2021. Um, some of them are shorter. There's a few things that are slightly different. Uh, for example, the buffers went from 110 feet to 240 or 310 feet. But for a chemical that could potentially volatilize and move a mile or more down the road, that's not all that impressive. Um, and there's also, uh, they have reduced the amount of active ingredient that is applied per acre. It was around one pound per acre of dicamba. Now it's a half pound. And there are um, pH buffering uh, adjuvants that are going to be required, as well as um, a, a few other chemicals that may have to be tank mixed with these uh, these dicamba products in order to be applied. But again, not terribly significant on the label change there. So dicamba is still a problem, despite cutoff dates, applicator training, label restrictions so very many restrictions. And in general, natural resource folks uh, agree that injury is drastically underreported, especially on trees. Okay, so now we're finished with the dicamba history part of this, and we're going to get into uh, the more interesting side for many of you, which is probably what does this look like on trees and, and where do we go from here. So I, again, this statement right here just really speaks to how I see this in Missouri. Um, I never really paid attention to trees, but in the last two or three years, I've actually started looking at trees in people's yards. And you know, it's amazing once you start looking what you see. This is a farmer that's referring to all the damage that he's seeing on people's trees and whatnot from dicamba. Um, and really, I can't hardly go anywhere in the state of Missouri without seeing herbicide injury of some sort, even if it's not dicamba. So what does it look like? Well, I bet you've seen it before, although you may not have, have recognized it. First, visible damage varies, okay? It depends on the species of the tree, the health of the tree when it's exposed, um, the, ex the intensity of the herbicide exposure event or events, it could be multiple times, and of course the timing. Uh, as I observe more and more of these trees that are hit, I think trees are more affected in the early part of the growing season when they're leafing out, rather than, you know, in the later part of the growing season when the leaves are nice and leathery and, and probably aren't responding much to um, dicamba exposure. Weather patterns also seem to change the, the visible damage. Uh, if it's really droughty, I don't think that we're seeing quite as much leaf symptoms as when it's it's a little bit wetter out. Um, flooding and drought can also influence when crops are planted, and so that influences when these spray events are potentially happening, whether it be early season or later in the growing, growing season. So common symptoms usually come about 7 to 21 days uh, after the exposure event. And so what we've noted is that the leaves are typically cupped or twisted, kind of elongated, strap-like, that melting look that I showed in my first slide. Petioles can be twisted sometimes, and I think this may be more related to 2,4-D than it is to dicamba. Uh, injury throughout the canopy, or this is the kicker, it can be patchy in a canopy. And some of you are like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it's it has to do with temperature inversions and here recently I was driving along the interstate and I look over and there's sort of a, a dip in a field and there's some trees growing there in this low spot and kind of a, a little drainage and the the fog was just perfect and it was kind of like fingers in in this tree canopy so some of the canopy was not exposed to that patchy fog and some of it was had there been dicamba in that you could easily see how the canopy would have been affected in a patchy way uh, versus, you know, throughout the entire canopy. 
So that's how we get this, this patchy look sometimes. You may only see injury on older or newer growth. It sort of depends on, on when that exposure event or events happened. So here's what suspected dicamba injury looks like. I say suspected because um, I don't have residue samples on many of these photos, but in general, these are, are just symptoms that we see widely across the board and what we have come to associate with dicamba and or 2,4-D. So red bud is incredibly sensitive. There's hardly a red bud in an urban area that doesn't have some form of, of growth regulator injury on it just because they're so sensitive. And as most of you know, a lot of the lawn care products, the pelletized uh, broadleaf weed control that we use in the US, it has either dicamba or 2,4-D or both in it. And so that's part of how so many red buds get injured. But you see this a lot in natural forested situations um, around ag areas. These, you can see these outermost leaves really look cupped and kind of the edges are crinkled and they feel very leathery. So that's, that's certainly a growth regulator um, injury right there. Here we have a white oak that exhibits that sort of melting look, but it's still nice and green, right? So are there any long-term health concerns with this. I mean, I would say in general, these leaves don't look anywhere near normal, but the tree probably is not going to die because of this this year anyway. Here we have a willow oak that you can see the, the ones on the left I would consider healthier, although they're exhibiting some uh, little twisted tips there and signs of a, a growth regulator injury. The ones on the right, my goodness, very dark green, but there's no way that leaf is functioning appropriately. You know, it's, it's probably not doing photosynthesis correctly. It may not be um, translocating nutrients or water quite right. And if this tree were to experience, say, a severe drought, would it die or would it be okay? We just don't know. Here we have um, a bald cypress and these leaves were actually off the same tree. Again, sort of that patchy canopy look or sometimes you know, the exposure event, maybe the, the leaves that are less affected, um, they were fully mature by the time the exposure event came along. You see on, on the right side, those leaves just don't look normal at all. Very long, strappy, just not right. Here we have a swamp white oak that exhibits some of that cobra heading, um, the real tight cupped leaf pattern in the earlier leaves and then the leaves that are, are coming out now, you can tell they're probably not going to be normal. Um, they're, they're probably going to exhibit some heavy cupping later on and, and just look not quite right for a swamp white oak. And I just mentioned cobra heading. These most curled leaves on the end are what I would consider very heavy cobra heading or cupping. Um, this is, I don't know how intense of an event is required um, to cause this type of damage, but this is something that we're very commonly seeing in Missouri um, on trees that are hit with growth regulators. All right, this one, this is a tricky one. Okay, since you're probably in a setting where you're alone, you can say what species you think this is, and I won't hear you, and I won't know if you're right or wrong. Any guesses? All right, it's white oak. Okay, this is these are white oak leaves that are so severely hit by herbicide that I would. We came up with a new term in Missouri. We call it the Medusa look because it's pretty terrifying. Um, these leaves were on the ground, and I think they probably came from uh, last year's herbicide exposure event. This was on a conservation area where we have hundreds of veneer quality white oak, which is pretty rare in Missouri. Um, but th these trees have been hit multiple years in a row to the extent that their leaves, these white oak leaves look like this. Now, I can't imagine that that's, that's good news for these trees. Here was um, the same general area, uh, trees in that area. This is what one of the branches looked like. So yes, the trees are still technically green, but I really doubt that these leaves are functioning properly. Um, and so we're gonna be in the future trying to figure out just how badly this affects the physiology of the tree. Here we have the same tree that the, the previous slide came from, that sample. Um, this is one of these big white oaks and you can see just how thin that canopy is. But the interesting thing about it is that the hickories, the maple, the tulip poplar that's growing around it, they're really not that affected 
um, by the dicamba or 2,4-D or whatever this is going to end up being, uh, they're just not showing the leaf injury that we have seen on the white oak and some of the red oaks. And part of that is, like I mentioned earlier, it has to do with timing, it has to do with exposure intensity, it has to do with probably how far along the leaves were when they got hit, um, and just the sensitivity of the species in general. Here we have a really cool picture from Martin Kemper in Illinois. Um, this is confirmed 2,4-D injury, which you can see the heavy cobra heading on these, these white oak leaves. And in the end, you know, I, I kept flashing that, what does this mean for the long-term health question? Do we end up with dead trees? I mean, there's some of us that think that enough of this exposure could lead to dead trees. We've not really seen that in Missouri as far as widespread tree death related to dicamba, but unless it's a really severe um, exposure event, we're probably not going to get trees that are dying directly of these herbicides. Instead, they're probably just being stressed by them to the point where you start bringing in other things like flooding or drought or you know just weather events in general, and that's one more layer of stress. And next thing you know, the insects and diseases are taken over and we get dead trees. It's kind of how I see this, just another straw on the camel's back. So as far as what we know about this type of injury on trees, unfortunately, we really don't know that much about it. Um, we, there are some greenhouse trials and studies out there, which that's great. However, we really don't have any limit, um, any long-term data on mature trees out on the landscape, like how these chemicals could be affecting those. There's really no same season multi-exposure data out there that I'm aware of. And, you know, there's, there's just not a long-term tracking program going on um, across many of these states to see, hey, are these trees actually dying after so many years of exposure? So there is an herbicide injury project that my state, um, as well as Indiana, Illinois, Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas are working on. Uh, we have two separate pots of money from the USDA Forest Service, um, including a pesticide impact assessment program uh, grant from them. So what we were doing was looking to see, you know, trying to link the symptoms to the cause. So the leaf symptoms to what's actually doing this to the trees. Uh, that includes residue testing at South Dakota State University. And then of course, taking pictures of these injured trees and you know, trying to come up with a photographic guide of this level of dicamba or 2,4-D leads to this kind of symptomology. Unfortunately, that has definitely been easier said than done. Um, the first issue, in case any of you are interested in starting kind of a residue testing program in your state, the first issue is that symptomatic tissue um, during our 2018 samples ended up showing low to no herbicide residues. And so we'd send in these samples that were really symptomatic for growth regulator herbicide. And I was like, wait a second, what do you mean? There's, there's no dicamba or only, you know, four parts per billion dicamba on these trees. What we figured out was that trees are metabolizing this herbicide by the time the symptoms appear, at least a lot of it. So they're getting hit, it's taking seven to 21 days to show symptoms. And then by the time, we find that tree, maybe it's, you know, six weeks later or two months after, and we see the symptoms, but the herbicide's all gone by then. So we decided we were going to take samples of asymptomatic leaves during periods of time when we thought um, a lot of spraying was occurring. And so if we revisited those trees a couple months later, we should be able to see the symptoms and then take photos of those to equate it to the original residue levels. So that was a good idea to try for 2019, but unfortunately we had weather patterns in some of our states that really led to these patchy spray schedules or just no planting. You know, Missouri planted, I think, 13% fewer soybean acres that year um, than normal. And so we just didn't have the, the same um, kind of cluster of dicamba applications that we'd had years prior to that. So we ended up with a lot of late planting or no planting um, due to flooding in Missouri. And then those mature leaves, by the time, you know, some applicators weren't spraying until sometime in July. And by then the tree's leaves were pretty mature and it didn't appear that they really responded the same 
um, they didn't have the symptoms that they would have had had the, those leaves been hit back in, in mid-May, for example. So for our Missouri results, um, we had 10 samples that we sent in and all came back positive for dicamba at 7 to 72 parts per billion. So eight samples were also positive for 2,4-D, so that just confirmed that these trees are getting hit with, with two different things, um, both growth regulators, so don't know how that is synergizing there. And then this was a new one for us. Seven samples also came back positive for quinclorac, which is an herbicide that's used in rice. And you think, okay, well, a lot of these trees, the samples were taken in areas near rice fields. Well, this particular vault cypress right here that came back with 52 parts per billion of, of quinclorac, there was not a rice field in sight. And a lot of the rice herbicide applications are aerial. Um, so I can see how it might get onto to some of our trees on our conservation areas boarding rice fields, but I don't know how this tree had so much quinclorac on it unless that herbicide is also volatile. Um, which it may be. Like I said, I'm an entomologist, not a wheat scientist. So willow oak right here, you can see that this tree, hey, it doesn't look that bad, right? I mean, you can see a few little curly leaves on the edge, but overall this tree looks pretty good. But here's its, its actual um, data that came back. 51 parts per billion dicamba, 200 parts per billion of 2,4-D. That was one of our highest uh, samples. So what we saw was earlier sampling, yes, it means less symptom development, but you get a lot more herbicide residue. Whereas the sycamore right here, if you look really closely, you can see the very um, yellow edges of the leaves and it, they look like a hoodie. The drawstring of a hoodie has been pulled. That's what sycamore typically does with dicamba or 2,4-D damage. This tree overall it looks pretty awful, I would say. And you can see that even though the symptoms were really prominent on it, there was hardly any dicamba and no 2,4-D detected. So the later you sample, the more symptom development you have, but the less herbicide residue that you're usually able to detect. All right, so in 2020, we did try again with asymptomatic samples. We collected 80 across the state um, and we targeted our collection dates to June 11th which if you remember back in uh, June on the 3rd, those dicamba labels were vacated and people didn't know what was going on for about five days in there, if they could spray them or not. And so it was hot and windy in Missouri during that time frame, And I think a lot of people sprayed dicamba at that point. So I suspect there's quite a bit of injury that was going on. Um, we revisited those same trees on September 2nd and took more samples and, and photos, but unfortunately the results are still pending on those interesting to see. You can see on this willow oak here that some of the, the earlier leaves were certainly hit pretty hard and some of the um, growth that came on later looks a bit more normal, although it probably would test positive for some growth regulator. So 2020 and beyond, what do we need? We need long-term tracking of tree health, in my opinion. We need to know if trees are really dying as a result of dicamba and 2,4-D injury or not. Um, I suspect that eventually there will be mortality due to this. Spray trials have been useful to determine how, would be useful to determine how uh, mature trees respond to dicamba because greenhouse studies, while they're informative, they're really not enough. We just don't know anything about how these mature trees are gonna respond to these growth regulators. And finally, since we have five more years of this stuff, well, I guess we might as well make the most of it and start considering some of these monitoring projects in our own states where we've seen injury. So I know Missouri will certainly be embarking on that in the next uh, five years. I totally agree with Dr. Hartzler here. If the only thing at risk were soybean fields, then let agriculture do what it wants. But when you start damaging native plants and trees, that to me is unacceptable. I completely agree that we just can't continue having this um, in our, our natural areas or really even in our ag areas. Because unfortunately, once you start looking, herbicide injury is everywhere and it's not just dicamba. Um, there's, there's herbicide injury of all different sorts that I've found on our conservation areas in Missouri. Um, a lot of fence lines and tree, it's just, it's terrible once you really start looking um, and it's all different kinds of chemicals. It's, it's really not just dicamba and 2,4-D. 
And you know, our herbaceous perennials are injured too. So we've spent a lot of time and money restoring monarch habitat. Um, and we have, you know, we just put all this effort into to helping different species and rehabbing the land. And then to have something like herbicide come in and set us back, it's just really disappointing. So you can see this rose mallow here has been hit pretty hard. Will it abort its flowers? I don't know, but it's certainly not um, having any favors done to it by this herbicide. Here we have hackberry. Um, this was, we have some ag crop on Missouri Department of Conservation Area lands and the applicators just got a little wild during their application and sprayed our, our tree line. You know, maybe not a big deal to some, um, but I just, I don't like to see this on, on public ground especially. So here's another one. Um, these leaves are almost unrecognizable, but they are a red oak of some sort. I couldn't even tell what the tree was by the time um, we looked at these leaves. So basically, are we okay with this? I think as natural resources, um, conservation people, gardeners, whatever you happen to be, is, is this gonna continue to be okay with you um, that these ag companies are allowing or are supporting you know farmers in in spraying this stuff i'm not mad at farmers i want to make that clear but i am pretty disappointed um, that so many of these these chemical formulations are just not a really good idea um, for widespread landscape use so you know behind this sign we have conservation apartment area that is sort of an oasis of habitat in a sea of ag. There's a rice field right next to this. You can see it there in the foreground. Um, and this, this tree line looks terrible every year because of herbicide and, and drift. So pretty sad. All right, and if any of you have time, I suggest you read uh, the report from uh, Prairie Rivers Network, uh, National Wildlife Federation, and the Xerces Society. It's called Drifting Toward Disaster. Um, the authors did a really nice job capturing all the issues that surround this topic. And last but not least, here's my contact information. I appreciate all of you listening today, and I would be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you so much. You do have questions. <laughs> okay, um, I can't see them, so could you read them to me, please? Sure, no problem. Uh, no problem. The, I'm, I'm trying to get to the top here. <laughs> so, oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Okay, some of them have been answered along the way here, but um, uh, Gregory Smith asks, are bark feeding sap sucking tree scales strictly insects? That's the first question we have. I think this was put on before you kind of started. I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm, <laughs> Go ahead. I think that's not related to. No, uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Um, let's see. He also asked. I've heard that 2,4-D damage causes leaves to curl up and dicama curl down. With both dicama and 2,4-D being tank mixed, what are leaf symptoms? Um, FYI, leaf hopper feeding on red bud mim mimics 2,4-D injury. It does, and it can. Yes, that is true. Um, although a lot of times we can kind of rule that out. So it is important that you, whenever you're looking at a tree that you suspect has herbicide injury on it, that you rule out some other thing causing those symptoms. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's pretty easy to rule out because there's just absolutely no evidence of an insect or, um, you know, some disease that might be causing that. Okay. Um uh, he, when, when you were talking about the white oak problem, uh, Phil Marshall says that is worse than white oak tatters damage, which is also herbicide caused. There was not much symptoms or damage on white oak in Indiana this growing season. Assume that cold, wet spring weather changed how farmers treated their fields and resulted in the wrong timing for herbicide to impact the trees. That was his comment. Yes, and, and Phil and I and um, Frederick over in Illinois, we've we end up having different weather patterns sometimes, and so we see different levels of, of injury in our states, even though we're all pretty close together. So thank you, Phil, for your comment. Um, um, John Woodmancy says, could some of the symptoms be confused with anthracnose? 
You know, in my experience, um, it does not look like anthracnose to me. Um, in fact, sometimes we'll find anthracnose on leaves that appear to be injured by herbicide also. Uh, but generally, we're seeing such severe injury that anthracnose just doesn't do that. So, yeah, I, I see where you're going with that question. Um, it, and we do note that on our samples if we're seeing any other insect or disease issues. But when we get the residue tests back and they have dicamba on them, then we know it's it's certainly not just anthracnose doing that. Okay. Um, he also says, isn't, okay, clin, the quin chloric an active ingredient in crab grass preventers. And I have seen other people saying yes here, answering that question, saying yes here. It's a component of um, crabgrass control and turf grass, and its trade name is Drive. That's from Curtis Young. Thank you, Curtis. Um, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, so many of these chemicals, you know, are used in ways that some people, like myself, I found out that it was in rice applications, but I had not come across that it was in uh, in turf, in crabgrass control. I think we've got a few landscape people on, here on this one, so <laughs> maybe that's helpful then. <laughs> okay. I think so, yes, it's very helpful. <laughs> um, the, let's see, Jeff Palmer says, dicamba, 2,4-D, and quinclorac are very commonly used in urban lawn care programs. Now that they are also used in causing damage in egg, do you think we are now just noticing more damage caused by lawn care operators? That's kind of a probably a. I mean, for me personally, in my position here in Missouri, I didn't deal much with herbicide injury in um, lawn care situations until I started seeing it so commonly in ag, and then I recognized it in urban areas too. And so, I mean, that's just been my personal experience. But I think I think a lot of people are starting to wake up to the fact that some of these um, urban lawn care practices are not terribly good for trees. All right. Um, Cliff Sadoff uh, says herbicide injury is often across multiple species, whereas biotic agents tend to be specific to plants. That's his comment. Um, okay, we've already answered that. Uh, and that is true even in these um, in these ag situations, although it is kind of interesting. Sometimes you'll have a whole tree line like this photo here that I'm showing where most of the oaks look one way and then there's a few species in there like the hedge it was not affected at all um, so you do get some variation there okay uh, let's see and now i think we are able to go and it says uh scale is a real problem in all scale let me see what this is here all scale pests are insects that was the answer probably to the first very first question all right, I'm going over to the Q and A pod now, folks. Don't I haven't missed you here? All right, um, Cliff Sadoff uh, says razor thin profit margins make it difficult for growers to stay economically viable without adopting cutting edge technology. Growers used to round up ready beans will have a major have to make major operational changes to go back to the way weeds were managed prior to herbicide ready grains. So with so many Roundup resistant weeds, growers are caught between a rock and a hard place. And um, what can growers do to avoid being, being the cause of injury while maintaining, maintaining acceptable weed control? Um, I don't know if that's something that you can answer, but we're throwing it out there to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I really think that this has put farmers in a, a tough position. Um, you know, they, some of them truly need the technology uh, based off of the weeds that are in their field and you know they they need to use it they don't some of them don't want to use it some of them fully recognize the issues that come with some of this technology um, I don't know what they can do uh, you know there's lots of suggestions in the weed science world as to how farmers can use cover crops and and other uh, weed control tools and it's probably in the future that they're going to have to consider some of those other tools besides herbicide or in addition to herbicide. But yeah, again, forest entomologists. <laughs> I actually um, do grow um, wine grapes in northern Michigan and I can tell you that 2,4-D and dicamba are also 
wine grapes are very sensitive to that. They are very, all grape is, yes. Yes, and it's been a problem, not so much in Northwest Michigan, because like, as you say, there's not much corn and soybeans and that kind of thing. But I know in Ohio and Illinois and Nebraska and even Kansas, yes. I've had growers show me problems with that. So I know what you mean, right. um, and it's hard. So let's see. Cliff says, have you noticed any increase in red oak boar and two line chestnut boars in response to the stress? We have not yet seen any increase in that. Um, the majority of our oak forests are actually quite a ways from uh, these areas where dicamba is being sprayed. So, you know, the Missouri Ozarks, there's zero soy, cotton, corn, nothing going on in the Ozarks, where we typically see um, red oak borer in high numbers every, you know, 20, 25 years. And two line chestnut borer, I would put that in the list of pests that are going to come after trees that are stressed. Um, but as far as there being a notable increase, I have not seen that yet, no. Okay. Uh, Mark Prinster says, oaks are a highly valuable food source for many species of Lepidopteran caterpillars. Many bird species rely on these caterpillars during migration and breeding. I am sure the nutritional aspect of these injured leaves compromises this part of the food chain. This needs to be investigated too. That was his comment. Yes, and there are certainly people that have, have picked up on that. Yeah, it's very concerning. Okay. Uh, in a study of effects, how would researchers control for variability of how applicators apply? With 40 pages, 40 page labels, I'll wager cynically that not, that is not being applied as consistent doses. Um, yeah, I, I think that the labels have made it very hard to um, hit those you know, to apply it properly. I, I do agree with that. And as far as a, a study goes, um, there's there's lots of conversation about how we could um, look at this. You know, we could, I'm not gonna get into that right now um, because there's, there's things in the works, but there's certainly ways that, that we could monitor uh, air quality and, and whatnot to see what volatility levels we're looking like in some of these forested areas. So that would probably be a route I would go rather than trying to worry about controls. Okay. Um, then um, an anonymous attendee mentions the, the Quinn Clorac, Clorac as an inter products and it so, so, and also says that this could be the source of the problem with the cypress there. Okay. Um, you mentioned, oh, okay. Elizabeth Jarvis, I hope we've already answered your question. Um, she says, you mentioned landscape companies using this for what? Um, we, would we be seeing this kind of leaf damage in urban settings? I guess that was on the, yes. yeah, okay. Oh, and then Cliff says, great, great idea to quantify the impact. Are you planning on building a case for new approaches to weed control? new approaches to weed control um to new approaches what, to new approaches to weed control yeah that, oh, okay. that's what i'm working on personally okay. i'm working on trying to figure out how this is impacting uh trees at this point okay let's see here um I kind of think this may be out of your purview, but um, it says, do you have any suggestions for how to balance the farmer's need for herbicides with protecting trees and other plants in natural areas? Or can you recommend any artis articles to someone who's talking about this problem? Um, you know, one of my favorite sources of information, at least on the popular side, is DTN. And um, the author that typically writes a lot about these dicamba issues is Emily Unglesby, and she does a great job of really laying out um, this, this whole issue. So I would recommend reading her articles, um, and then I would also read that Drifting Towards Disaster report that I, I showed one slide back. Um, I think that this lays out a good line of thinking as well. Okay. Is, is there, a, I'm, I'm looking, the, the, in the drifting toward disaster, is there um, a, a, a link you could give me and I could put it in our um, 
Um, yeah, or just Google drifting toward disaster and it okay. pops right up. Yeah. All right. I will I will mention that that they can do that then in that in their email they'll get tomorrow then. Okay. Oh, and it also says don't hesitate to contact your extension agents for drift reduction. Weed scientists love helping growers avoid drift in addition to other integrated weed pest management problems. So, oh, and Cliff has put down the, thanks Cliff, I will use that link, thank you, for the drifting toward disaster. All right, um, I'm trying to make sure I've got all these going here. Um, are you hopeful that the new EPA regulations will be helpful? Do you know if there's data on response to seedling development for native endangered species? I know developing soybean seeds are exceptionally sensitive and I think perhaps the EPA estimate of the NOAEL may be too low. Yeah, um, am I hopeful that the new regulations will help? Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that the new labels will help some, but I don't think it's gonna solve the issues that we're seeing. And as fewer and fewer people report um, injury across my state, especially, you know, everybody's just tired of reporting it and nothing happening. And I think people just decided they're going to live with it. And that's fine um, if they want to do that. But I'm more worried about the forests in my state in these agricultural areas. Are these forests going to be able to live with it? Um, so, so that's why we're starting a monitoring project in Missouri to, to keep an eye on what's happening and and we'll try to figure out how these trees are responding long term. So okay. I don't know, part of me is hopeful and part of me is a little, is pretty concerned actually. Okay. Um, Cliff thought you gave a great answer to the first question so that he had here up here, um, just so you know. <laughs> um, other than that, <laughs> I think we've got the questions and for in the chat and the in the comments all covered here, folks. Again, I will be giving, um, you will see Robbie's contact info in the letter that, or the email you're going to receive tomorrow, as well as other information that you kind of, guys have kind of been asking for. And um, I think this was a fantastic um, webinar. I think you've, you've covered uh, something that we haven't really talked about before. An EAB university, I think, again, is, is a, a growing problem in now at least is getting out there and there's going to be getting some more attention to it. So thank you so much, Robbie, for providing this information yep. and, and, and being, uh, um, and sharing it with all of us here um, in EAB University. So folks, I'm going to end this now and thanks again for your participation and uh, let us know if there's any other kind of um, subjects you'd like to, to tackle with at EAB University. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks.